Good day. I am Ann Mazikowski, president of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County. And on behalf of our league, I want to thank you for joining us for our hot topic, the impact of AI on elections. The mission of the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan organization, encourages informed and active participation in citizenship, elections, and democracy, and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and to influence public policy through education and advocacy. One of the ways we help fulfill our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy is to offer presentations to inform the public and voters on the importance of exercising your right to vote within our democracy. Today's program is a good example of informing our communities about vital issues that impact our mission. This presentation will shed light on how powerful artificial intelligence, AI tools could allow anyone to create fake images, video, audio that was realistic enough to fool voters and perhaps sway an election. We're gonna be recording this program and we also have received questions. So thank you, but if you want to put a question in the chat, we'll be monitoring that also. And now Kathy Youngman, our Vice President and Chair of our Communications Committee, will introduce our presenters. Hi, everyone. Uh, when ChatGPT first became available for public use, I got sucked into the vortex. <laughs> its potential for slashing the time it takes to create things like blew my mind. And within a few days, I was using ChatGPT to create a presentation for our local uh, League of Women Voters ho holiday party last December, just nine months ago. I asked it to create a poem about the League in the style of Amanda Gorman, the young poet who wowed everyone at President Biden's inauguration. You guys remember her? Um, a lot has, hip has happened since December. Nine months ago, ChatGPT would churn out a very critical, uh, credible League-targeted poem in a very specific style. But now, Artificial intelligence-based tools can use snippets of visuals and voice recordings of the poet and create a really credible video of her reading the artificially generated league poem. Who could tell it was a deep fake? What does this form of artificial intelligence mean for our democracy? When can I get my personal AI assistant, who, by the way, will be the world's best writer, best graphic designer, and best pickleball coach, which I really need? Pretty soon, I hear that's going to be coming. So our presenters today are both brilliant folks who know a great deal about how artificial intelligence or AI interfaces with elections and democracy. As soon as I heard Susan Gonzalez's podcast interview on Marketplace.org, I used my Siri personal AI researcher to plumb info about her. Susan Gonzalez is founder and CEO of AIandYou.org, which she launched after 20 plus years working in tech and telecom in policy and community engagement. Susan's a member of President Biden's um, National AI Advisory Committee and is co-author of A Blueprint for in Inclusivity in AI, which was a World Economic Forum 2022 report. She's worked for both Comcast and Facebook in senior director positions. She'll share her insights about AI and her organization, which promotes mm -hmm. AI literacy to marginalized voters and Gen Z voters. Um, the impetus actually for organizing this presentation came from an article written by our other presenter, Michaela Panda Thwartney. Um, I, I apologize up front, Michaela, I'm sorry for not getting your last name correctly. Uh, Michaela serves as counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, where her work focuses on elections, voting, and truth and information. You yeah. might recognize Michaela because she was part of our um, previous Brennan Center panel about el uh, election information this past March. Uh, Michaela will share analysis from her recent uh, Brennan Center report how AI puts elections at risk and the needed safeguards. This report highlights how artificial intelligence tools can help fuel the spread of disinformation and create hazards to democracy. Mm -hmm. Please use the chat to submit questions 
uh, which we will moderate and ask our guests um, after their presentations. We request that you remain muted during the presentations so we don't hear all that personal stuff that's going on in your house. Also, please know that the Zoom is being recorded and we'll send you the link for the recorded presentation and a list of related web resources in a couple of days. Let's start with you, Susan. Can you give us the big picture about what's happening in AI? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And this is such an important conversation. And just a big, even a bigger picture is to let people understand, um, you know, I learned about AI the first time eight years ago when I was at Facebook. And this new technology was allowing the blind community to access the platform. And so I thought, well, that's that's really cool. You know, this must be able to help, be able to help other communities as well. So after I left the company about four and a half years ago, I decided to launch a nonprofit, AI and you. So it's A N D U dot org with the intent of educating marginalized communities about the benefits and risks of AI. And marginalized communities are women, people of color, disabled, uh, disabilities, LGBTQ, and others. And so in the spirit of educating um, about all aspects of AI, and you can go to the website and there's very, uh, the, the approach is easy to understand language. So you can learn about, you know, what is an algorithm? How how does AI how do how does AI work when I apply for a loan you know that type of thing, but it, as I was mentioning in the spirit of educating all about AI um, we're talking about the election today, and from my perspective, the 2024 election is going to be all about AI literacy, meaning voters having a basic understanding of what the technology is, how it works and how it is impacting your vote. So, and I do just wanna take one minute just to paint a big picture about artificial intelligence because a lot of us talk about it like everybody else understands it. And there are very widely varying understandings of artificial intelligence. But in essence, AI feeds off data. It needs data to work. And so where do they get the data? We are the data. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right, because like in cardiovascular diseases and all kinds of health issues, it's making everything much more efficient. But sometimes it can go wrong. And so, how do we create data? This is how we create data. You know, someone asked me, "Well, when was the first time I, I interacted with AI today?" And I said, "Well, what time did you pick up your device? Did you use your your face to open your phone?" So what happens is every time we're clicking, we're creating a digital footprint. That data is taken to create an algorithm. An algorithm is basically the recipe that makes AI work. And so data, algorithm, AI to us. And again, if you think about it, now we can shop online, we can grocery shop online, we can do basically anything online. These are things we could not do four years ago during the last election. And the point is, is that the same technology that allows us to do all those cool things is also the backbone of some of the things that are not so great with this election. And that's what we're here to talk about is, you know, disinformation. Um, but I do want to paint, make one really important point is this election is expected to be decided by a small percentage of voters. If you think about the last few elections, those voters are women and people of color. And actually, we're not going to be focusing on the Gen Zs anymore. We're going to be broader and focus on women and people of color in this next election to help everybody understand what's happening around misinformation. So these groups are likely going to determine this next election. And so it's important that everybody have a baseline understanding of what's happening. Should I go into the AI in election now or, or is that helpful? Okay, so with this election, um, in addition to all these other cool things we can do with these technologies, the biggest difference is now, in the past, there you had to be sort of like a very fancy technology person to create, get online and create these almost real looking uh, political ads, commercials, for example. That's not the case. It, anybody can do that. Anybody can get on their laptop and they can create a fake commercial. So if you if you 
haven't heard about it, I would suggest you search after this event and look up um, former President Trump hugging Dr. Fauci or President Biden in be, being presented to us in a commercial as is he as if he has just created a war. So these are the types of things that are happening. They're all over the world. They're happening in Toronto and New Zealand. They're, it's happening globally. These images look real. And there's no, there's nothing. Here's the most important thing to know. There are no guardrails. There are no laws. There are no consequences. Everything has happened so quickly that Congress has just not been able to keep up. So there is nothing and there likely will not be anything that is going, there's not going to be a source where, for example, on our platform, you can go and be like, well, how can I check if this is real or not? That's not happening yet. I don't know if it will happen over the next 12 months. So the bottom line is about this election is you cannot believe anything you see, read, or hear. Deep fakes are videos or other images, voice that are created that are not real. And just to give you an example, I wanted to understand deep fakes a little more a few months ago. So I hired my 17 year old family member who was on his way to college, who knew nothing about deep fakes, but I knew he was a smart kid. And I said, can you just create a, a deep fake for me? I just want to understand what it looks like. It took him about eight hours. And I said, let's do something extreme. Create one where it is Biden supporting the NRA and Trump supporting a woman's right to choose. Let's see if we can make that. Eight hours later, he didn't quite get there because he had to leave for the to pack up and move into his dorm, but he got very close. Believe it or not, the issue was hair. Hair is difficult on deep fakes, but that is just illustrative of where we are. So unfortunately, you know, what we can suggest is just don't believe anything until you do a lot of research. And here's one key thing too. It's not only online. So broadcast stations such as you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, et cetera, legally, they are not allowed to alter political commercials, ads that have been bought. So there could be a deep fake ad that is on ABC News, and we're going to think it's real, and it's not. And so I would just you know ask everybody to spread the word, to share this message, and importantly, there are no guardrails. That's really the most important point. But on the flip side, there are also new tools that, for example, your organization could use to motivate voters, to get out the vote, to manage your own systems. And the best way to do that is just search. You know, what are the new AI tools to help um, organize voters in my community and see what you come up with? And the reason I say there's no one source because everything is happening so quickly. So I'm saying this today and there may be something new tomorrow and there'll be something new or next week. So, so that's where we are. It's a very unusual situation. And most importantly, I do wanna let you know and mark your calendars. Next Tuesday, AI and andu.org, we are launching an elections public awareness campaign. And that campaign is including very easy to understand descriptions of everything I'm talking about and much more. So you can go to our website after Tuesday and just learn everything you want. We have a video, we have a glossary, we have FAQs, we're going to do community events and outreach such as this. So that's a broad picture, but I want to hand it over to the other panelists as well. Uh, thank, thank you, you much. very much, Susan. Um, and I just want, I've, I've looked at the videos on Susan's website and they're really good. They get, they're very easy to understand mm -hmm. and explain things really well. Thank you. Sure. Michaela, how worried should citizens be about AI interference in our election? Can you help us understand? Yeah, sure. Um, and thanks for for that excellent presentation. Um, uh, so you know, I'll maybe give a little bit of a world whirlwind um, tour through through some of the informational issues that that we see. And and of course, we're also interested um, in other aspects of the intersection of AI and elections, like the use of AI in election administration. Um, election security issues um, and 
political fundraising, political advertising, but but some of my comments here will will sort of zero in on on the potential impact on the information environment. Um, so you know, I think there are a lot of questions about what the sort of new generative AI tools and the new developments in AI do that is is truly novel. How um, you know, or or do they simply amplify or exacerbate longstanding existing issues and in, in elections? Um, which, you know, I think, I think to to some extent, um, that that sort of question maybe um, is is misdirected in in some ways because there are these um, very clear changes in scale, speed, and sophistication that added up make a difference in kind in 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 my view um and and that is something that um that that we are very likely to see so in in terms of impacts i think we can separate out the different modalities so the image generation tools and the video and audio generation tools these are the deep fake tools from those it's possible that we might see an increase in viral moments from deep fakes that are cheaper and easier to produce and look more sophisticated. Um, from language models, um, we might see the manufactured illusion of co consensus on political or other topics. Um, from use of those language models, we might see proliferation of comments that seek to misrepresent public opinion on elections process and other issues. And we have the possibility of impersonation of figures like election officials, election office websites, and other fake news sources. Um, and then, you know, in addition to, to visual deep fakes and, and audio deep fakes, we also have the possibility of interactive digital or other kinds of disinformation. Um, you know, and this is maybe not the most um, pressing concern for, for 2024, but I think long term, this is one of the, the most high risk areas where language models are potentially trained on influence or manipulation techniques and potentially specifically trained to produce false information and target voters' um, demographic characteristics. Um, we know that the EU has, has banned um, AI tools that are capable of monitoring emotional states in, in certain contexts. And, and you know, that's something that that could be used in, in the election context, unfortunately, as well um, for deceptive purposes. Um, that's sort of, you know, the worst, the worst case scenario. But um, I think, you know, when we when we're talking about potential regulation, um, those are the kinds of issues that we should we should also be thinking about. Um, we did some tracking of misinformation in prior um, in the midterm elections, and um, our research was consistent with um, some of the findings of other disinformation scholars in that um, election deniers um, aren't aren't really reinventing the wheel. A large portion of the, the disinformation narratives that they share are um, use recurring tropes, um, recurring false claims about the election process. So they, they are the, there are these core false narratives that um, recur over time. And one thing we know about generative AI tools is that they are most effective when they're being asked to um, produce content that resembles what is in their training databases. Um, so one thing we can be confident about, unfortunately, is that there is plenty of existing disinformation in the training databases underlying current generative AI tools, such that they could be put could be um, pretty effective at, at producing election um, misinform mis and disinformation, even, um, even as sort of news events are, are continually occurring. Um, there's also you know, been a, a pernicious history of deceptive practices designed to suppress votes and intimidate voters in the US. Um, this has occurred through the spread of flyers or robocalls, things like that, where people sp spread, intentionally spread false information about how to vote, when to vote, and where to vote. Um, unfortunately, that kind of practice could be 
um, supercharged by generative AI. Um, that's a, a potential risk. Um, and, you know, again, here we have the possibility of, um, of the spoofing of election websites on a, on a large scale and other election official accounts and, and the interactive digital dis disinformation that I mentioned earlier. So automating potential persuasive conversations with eligible voters on a massive scale. Um, again, that's the worst the worst case scenario, but um, you know, I think it it's something that when we're thinking about what we want government to do about this, that is that is something that that we should be um, keeping our eye on. Um, you know, we'll also have to see how this plays out, but it's possible that AI could increase the effectiveness of malign foreign influence campaigns. Um, there's limited evidence that that Russia's attempt to influence the 2016 um, election uh, was uh, effective at, at changing the election outcome. Um, but, uh, you know, we know that that Russia's prior efforts have been marred by, by some obvious flaw, flaws. So the content that that has been produced by these information campaigns, um, you know, has been marred by uh, grammatical errors. Um, it has seemed dissonant um, often in the information environment and um, you know, misused idioms, incorrectly used back ticks and so on. And um, generative AI has, has the potential to both cut out the need for so many human intermediaries as well as blunt some of those, those flaws that we saw in, in previous previous um, efforts and, you know, even a small difference when multiplied by the millions could, you know, we could see it, see a change there in, in terms of um, the impact and, and the persuasiveness. Again, you know, that's, it's sort of speculation at this point. Um, we don't have the concrete evidence um, for that, but, but, you know, it's something certainly for us to keep an eye on, especially as as countries around the world have um, have elections, um, these countries typically um, test out their information operations on smaller countries, and and um, and so we'll certainly want to keep an eye on on elections, um, for example, in in Taiwan and other countries as they as they come up. Um, and then, you know, overall, we also might see a, a decrease in trust in authoritative election information sources. So authoritative election sources are under siege, as we all know, in the wake of January 6 and the spread of election denialism. And generative AI could um, exacerbate that phenomenon by prompting a decrease in trust in the overall election information environment. So it may, might make it harder for voters to distinguish between what is true and what is false. And this actually has been a longstanding goal of foreign influence campaigns um, to just muddy the inv information environment so much that, that people are just confused and they're, um, they sort of distrust um, information sources generally. Um, so, so that's definitely one of the, one of the biggest risks in the, um, in the, uh, in this space. And, you know, I definitely want to talk about potential solutions later, but I'll, I'll just leave it for there for now. You know, I just want to follow up on a couple of things that Michaela had mentioned um, to really set context. So when, when, you know, I guess the question would be was like, well, how can I, how can I be targeted? How will someone know that I might be, you know, that I'm a woman and I'm online? Um, why, why would I start getting in particular um, misinformation ads, and by the way, this is this is also letters. You can get fundraising letters in the mail that are fake. You can get to Michaela's point. You can get voicemails that are fake. It's not just things that we see, but keep in mind that the technology has gotten so good at re at reviewing the data that we create. So the technology doesn't know my name, and and well, pretty much it probably does, but. But it will, the technology recognizes our behavior. And so to, to, to kind of touch on what can you do to protect yourselves, watch your behavior online. Because once we, let's say, let's say someone is an independent voter 
and they're clicking on, on this candidate and then they're clicking on that candidate, well, that candidate's party, that campaign will have access to that data and that will trigger, oh, well, this person is independent just based on their clicks. We're going to start targeting them with these fake ads so we can sway their vote. So I think at its very simplest level is to be aware of your activity online. And the other thing too, is that um, when we're, uh, Michaela had mentioned like large or language models. So there's two things about AI. One is called predictive. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, why do you think we get recommendations on, on Amazon or Netflix, right? If you like, if you like romance movies, well, that's kind of funny how it's always, you know, recommending romance movies because the AI is recognizing a pattern in our behavior. And so it's sending us romance movies. So, so that's at the, at the core of predictive AI. Generative AI, which is the new thing that people are more aware about most recently, is based on large language models, meaning that this new phase of AI can recognize language, can recognize us speaking into a computer and asking it questions and it, and, and it responds. And so within this big, you know, big, pie of information, you can see, and Michaela had some incredible, really good points that yes, globally, Russia, China can, can get to us, believe it or not, as individual voters because of the technology. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Don't believe anything you read, see, or hear. Because unfortunately, that's all we can offer right now. As I mentioned, there are no guardrails, there are no consequences for creating misinformation. And so we as voters are going to have to continue. We're going to have to be cross-referencing. And I, I, I wish I had, a, I really never like to present a problem without a solution, right? This is a big problem with no solution. So what we can do is educate. So when, especially Tuesday, when we launch our platform, please share it with your membership, just so there's a basic understanding. And so people don't automatically react to, let's say, a fake ad that they get to sway their vote? Well, I I have a, a couple of really interesting questions from based on what you both have presented. Um, one of the things, let me just get the gallery up so we can see everyone's face. Um, one of the things that have come out recently in politics is something called Eagle AI. We in the League of Women Voters are very interested in the back end of voter registration and uh, voting rolls and things like that. Um, and this is something uh, that's a bogus voter verification system. Can one mm. of you talk about that and its effect on the next elections? I am not familiar with that, Michaela. Are you? Uh, yeah, I can talk a little about that. And um, also, thanks so much, Suzanne, for that really helpful um, clarification. Um, so, yeah, so so in the in the past, I mean, this is another example of, of where new AI tools are amplifying practices that have existed previously and, and sort of creating greater risks where they're already were risks and and so in the, in the prior election cycle we saw high profile election deniers who were connected to the um, attack on the capitol on january 6 um conducting training and trainings and mobilizing groups of citizens to um conduct various activities in, including um combing through voter rolls with uh, the in, with the intention of preparing challenges to voters' registration statuses, and um, and they were you know essentially performing amateur data matching, um, which we know can has a high risk of of it's is highly error prone and it is um, you know risks wrongful voter disenfranchisement and and propelling disinformation. So what is happening now is that that same group um, is training activists using 
an AI tool called, called Eagle AI. And we don't know everything about it, but what it seems to be from how it's described is a system that um, is fairly, you know, non-complex in, in the sense that it it compares voter registration data against um, public records, um, various public records that have been scraped from the web, does a fairly rudimentary data matching um, analysis, and then flags um, voters for further investigation, and then auto prepares voter challenge forms. And you know the issue with this is is that well, I mean there are a number of issues, but again, you know we, these types of practices when they're conducted in this amateur rudimentary Entry way are highly flawed, but you know this. This is rightly called an AI system, but it isn't all that complex or sophisticated. And and so, you know, we now that there is all of this um, buzz around AI, um, it's sort of giving it this this veneer of of sophistication and a mystique that it it doesn't necessarily deserve um, and lending credibility to to um, and you know actions that that shouldn't have that that kind of credibility and and you know also gives the potential to file these mass voter challenges that that risk again wrongful disenfranchisement and and could fuel um, disinformation campaigns. Wow, that's so interesting. I, I definitely want to look more into Eagle AI so I appreciate that question. I did see a question in the chat. Um, Kathy, can I address that um, on sure. about Facebook? Yeah. Sure, um, sure. So what's interesting about Facebook, and I was there for five years, is um, if you think about it, when we sign up for in anything, have you noticed that basically everything requires you to get an app or requires your email? It requires you to accept the cookies. Um, and I'll talk about that. So when we sign up, for example, Facebook, Believe it or not, we are agreeing to a certain level of providing data. Do any of us read the 30 page, you know, or however long privacy notice? Absolutely not. So what's interesting I'm finding about what I'm doing in the AI literacy space is that the companies, the social media companies and the AI developers, they're not really that comfortable with what I'm saying because I'm using that four letter word, data. So it's a very, very touchy topic. Now, what I can suggest you do, well, first of all, I, I do have a privacy video on what you can do, but keep in mind, uh, you know, when we get on a website, it's as simple and complex as this. And it says, do you accept these cookies? Never, ever, ever accept them because what you're, you're, you're giving that site permission to track your data, to access your data. So most often there's a little tiny little, you know, an X in the corner, but Often it will say manage your preferences and go to go to a website that you've never been to today. And I promise this will happen. Often they will say manage your preferences. You go into manage your preferences and there's always going to be one little bar you cannot change. It's going to say needed for, you know, website, whatever experience. But often there's like four other things that you can uncheck. And they are often about your data. And so um, I am a huge proponent of, of really diving into cookies before I ac access any website. Um, some of them I've noticed, in fact, I was on one yesterday, it will say decline all and I decline all. Um, so keep that in mind. So we are the ones that are creating data. And at the same time, we are the ones that are giving them permission. But check out the privacy video on AI and you, and you'll get a little more insights into that as well. Wow, that was really helpful. I often wondered what that meant at the bottom. Thank well, you. cookies, if you think, so cookies are basically, it started, you know, I don't know, 25 years ago. Cookies are, were created when you get your hand caught in the cookie jar. <laughs> and so basically, you know, these websites are like, ha, gotcha. Basically, that's the most simple explanation I can give. So that's why they're called cookies. Um. Mm -hmm. You talked about there being no guardrails. 
Correct. Um, what kind, there are a lot of questions that came in when people registered for this about what kind of legislation or regulation is even possible and what's the path to that? There isn't. There isn't. Um, I, I am, I'm very active in Washington, D.C. on this topic and particularly with my role with the AI Advisory Committee with the president, but but even on Capitol Hill, working with a number of congressional offices, it's not going to happen. Um, there is so much confusion on, on even how to regulate AI. No, but nobody in, in history of our country have ever um, experienced this type of challenge. So on one hand, the companies, for the most part, are saying, oh, no, we don't need broad legislation. We need little pieces because a lot of stuff is actually OK. But then there's another audience that says, oh, no, we need a huge sweeping, huge sweeping re re regulation. But most interestingly, interestingly, the FEC a few months ago came to a vote on um, watermarks for deep fakes, which is like a see through logo, if you will. So that would be like with, um, you know, Anne's background, you wouldn't see the words, but you would see a faded image of that. That's called a watermark. What came to a vote at the FCC was we need to require anything that is artificial and it is AI generated to have a watermark that says AI generated. Didn't pass. Because even at that level, the leaders of the FEC, half of them were like, this isn't our jurisdiction. Congress should do it. And then the other half were like, but somebody needs to do something. We should do this. It didn't pass. So what we're like, what? October's and they were like 13 months away. I got to look up how many days we are away from the 400 and something days away from the election. We should not expect any legislation at all in this space. Maybe something will move next year in AI somewhere. I, maybe, but definitely not in time for the election. I'm curious about whether either of you know anything about the difference in um, your opinion uh, regulation because they seem to value privacy more and they they seem to uh, have more regulation regarding us. Well, I'm sure Michaela can speak more to that, but just broadly, um, the UK, for whatever reason, is ahead on there. Are they more organized or are they are they um, is it easier for their leadership to work together? I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but they definitely are ahead of us in coming up with something. And I think it, quite frankly, I think it's because of the leadership. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll just say, I think the EU is, has been ahead of us in a range of, on a range of tech issues, including transparency. And, and in addition to what Susan mentioned, um, there is a, there are sort of fewer First Amendment issues, and I think also some sort of cultural differences in in how regulation is is approached. But um, you know, there are certainly um, lessons to be to be learned from from the EU approach and and some of the proposed frameworks we're seeing in Congress um, borrow borrow from that approach. The kind of risk assessments, um, designating certain certain uses of AI as high risk. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, it, the, the EU is going to set the set the standards just because it's 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 far ahead of, of America. Um, but, I, you know, I think I think it's critical that that, that um, regulators and and legislators move on on this issue. Right. I'm reading the um the chat here. Um, can we expect tech leaders to self-police and add these watermarks to their product? Absolutely not. We want to know why? Because we may not click as much and they get paid advertising dollars based on how much we click. So there's a term called clickbait. I don't know if anybody's heard about that. Clickbait is something that is online that it's like fishing, just interesting enough for us to click on it. And then we click again and we click again, we click again. So unfortunately, in an unprecedented experience, this is going to be on us as voters 
to again be super diligent about what we're clicking on and how we how much we believe. I see another question about erasing cookies. Is there value in erasing cookies after each of your sessions on Chrome? I, I don't know. I mean, the value would be is I think you've already by the time you you've clicked there the data is already there. So maybe we feel better by erasing it. I don't know that it actually you know erases everything our information. So what happens is that the campaigns this year they buy our data through brokers. So a campaign could go to a, a data broker and say, I want you know to know what all the women in Arizona are doing. You know, what's their behavior? Like, what are they looking to? And whatever the consensus is on where all the women are going, then that's where they're going to go with their ads, real or fake. Hmm. Kind of uh, veering off from that last statement, um, we had a good question. Is the biggest threat of AI generated misinformation coming from within campaigns looking to discredit their rivals? from PACs associated with political parties or from foreign actors, or is it all equally them? You know, to be determined, um, what I understand is the fake ads are probably not going to be created by the campaigns themselves, but they have many arms to do that, right? That isn't necessarily them directly, but there are other ways to work around that. And absolutely from a global perspective that, you can bet that right now, well, I mean, look, Russia tried to interfere lat four years ago. Can you imagine what is going to potentially happen now? It's all a question. This is unprecedented territory for everybody. Um, one of the questions that we had are, is uh, what are the most important one or two things that everyday people can do to understand AI and protect our democracy from things that might generate confusion or disinformation? I would go back to encouraging all of your friends and family to get a basic understanding. So everything we've discussed today, my guess is you probably haven't heard it before because most people don't. They don't, they don't understand what's the connection between my cell phone, my laptop, or my iPad and AI. They, they don't get it. They don't get that we are creating the food for AI, for example. Again, not necessarily a bad thing. There are many amazing things happening, especially in health and education in some respects. So it's not all bad, but it can go wrong. And, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, I would just add to that, uh, you know, there are generally credible sources of information, like your, generally speaking, your local election official, your state elections officials, um, the National Association of Secretaries of State, vote.gov. Um, you know, these are, are, generally speaking, sources of author authoritative and accurate election information. And, you know, I think I think um, having those go-to sources and being familiar with, um, you know, particularly your, your county um, or uh, local election office website um, and, and accounts, I think is, is important. Um, and uh, sort of developing a practice of cross-checking cross um, claims that and and images that that seem outlandish or um strike you as out of the ordinary against authoritative sources of inf information like like trusted um trusted newspapers and uh official election websites uh, i see a question um oh go ahead i mean kathy are you reading the questions go ahead I was just going to read the question that you were probably just going to read um, from Elizabeth. Do you know of any resources available in other language that could help people understand more about AI? She's thinking about her family and Latino and Spanish speaking residents in Pennsylvania. Yes, actually, all the content that we have created on AI and you is in Spanish. So we have Spanish language videos, Spanish language content for everybody. 
And can you give us exact specific examples of trusted publications and trusted sources of information besides election officials? <laughs> mm. Brennan Center? Um, Brennan Center? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I am, uh, I think local newspapers that are legitimate local newspapers can play a, a critical role, particularly because so much um, election information is locally specific, um, because the way that we run elections varies um, a tremendous amount between different jurisdictions. And so if you um, have a a legitimate um, uh, local newspaper that that is very helpful. Of course, we know that local newspapers have um, died off around around the country, and that is a huge problem as well. And in their wake, um, fake news sites have sprung up, and you know this is also an issue with generative AI that generative AI can produce. Um, false uh, fake news websites in a matter of minutes, essentially. Um, and uh, and so, you know, again, you know, the 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 task of identifying what is what is an authoritative news source will, will become harder over time. I'm wondering if there's some place like CISA, the cybersecurity folks, where we can get some trusted information uh from the government is there yes CISA maintains a rumor control page um that addresses um common uh rumors and um uh can areas of confusion about the elections process and and so that is a a good resource um especially for um for people who have some doubts um about uh the integrity of our elections, which may be unfounded, um, which are unfounded, but um, but you know that that is a good resource to to go to. But just to be clear, I would not. Um, I, I, I'm I'm happy here about CISA, but I would not expect a CISA or that type of um, resource to be able to keep up with all of the misinformation and the deep fake. So I think. It could be wrong, but maybe they're helpful on the election side of things, but on the voter side and like what's coming out, I don't think that there's any one sort, although there isn't right now, that's going to be able to keep up with the pace of fake information that's coming out. Um, I want to address, uh, go ahead, Kathy, if you want to get another couple of questions about health and then public radio. Um, you mentioned the health um, earlier, Susan. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of how sharing yes. data helps? So think about it. Again, we are the data. So when we go into our doctor's office these days, aren't you know, we're often clicking in on an iPad or we're checking in on something or everything's done, you know, online. And when we go, so let's say we sit down with a doctor in the past, let's say I'm um, look, I'm a breast cancer survivor. So my oncologist in the past would refer to her other patients that are in her written files and learn from it and determine how to approach my, my cancer. But today, because of AI, these doctors now can access within seconds, if minutes, if not seconds, massive amounts of patients that had breast cancer. And let's say it's, you know, and then they could even zero in breast cancer patients, Latina, you know, around my age. So as opposed to going through the hard copies of paper, now in, within seconds, they're accessing all this information. And in fact, recently, it was announced that oncologists, specifically with breast cancer, ironically, they are improving their accuracy of diagnoses by 20% when they're using an AI tool to help them access more data. So no longer is it by pen and paper, and we can only access what's in the doctor's file. Now they have access to massive amounts of data. And, and keep in mind that that also is reflective in the election, right? Again, that's why these campaigns, I would say campaigns or the PACs or whoever have access to massive and massive amounts of data. And also I believe, I'm not a medical person, but I believe that our mammograms and other Medical mm -hmm. tests are oftentimes read by artificial intelligence, basically. 
Well, it's called augmented AI in that case. So augmented meaning that it's not solely determined by AI, but that the physician will augment their decision with AI information. That's like, you know, let's say in a factory, um, people may not be replaced by robots, but they will have augmented roles where they are now working alongside a robot, for example. Can I ask you the big question for league people who like to become legislative advocates and help think about deeply about policy? What kind of policy should we be trying to get passed by the government to kind of rein in AI a little bit? Well, that's the question they're all asking themselves <laughs> right now. So there have been a number of um, smaller pieces of legislation that have been dropped over the past couple of months. They haven't really gone anywhere. Um, there's one that's being in, that's drafted now um, specifically around AI literacy that Congress needs to acknowledge that the country needs some level of AI literacy. That's something that, you know, NIAC, the um, AI advisory committee that we're looking into as well. So unfortunately, there's no one answer. So it's going to be, you know, stay tuned. And when your local officials are pursuing some type of um, legislation, the one thing I would offer is that there are AI caucuses now on the House and in the Senate. So, um, and, and they're typically at the state level now, and they're starting to create more. There's like one person or two, you know, that are leading AI. Those are the ones that you need to be tracking the most because eventually some, either they're going to draft legislation or something's going to need to come through them. But they're, they're not the, they're not official caucus. They're not committees. They're just caucuses, which is different. You know, they're not official committees that they have to vote. They're just caucuses, which is a, a resource. Um, and I'll give a sort of high level um, addition to that, which is, I, I think, um, in, in every sort of sector, people are thinking about what is the sort of balance between overarching regulation and then sector specific regulation? And I think some combination is needed in general and, and certainly in the elections and governance space. Um, some of the, the broad things that we're thinking about um, are sort of uh, legislation to address um, deceptive practices in voter suppression um, that is exacerbated by AI, um, disclosure by campaigns of their use of AI in elections um, and other um, political committees and, and uh, actors. Um, transparency and accountability for the use of AI in election administration is, is something that, you know, also potentially warrants um, action and attention. Um, and then uh, more funding to, I mean, these are sort of longstanding recommendations that we've had, but more funding to election offices to um, bolster voter, voter education efforts um, for a cyber, um, uh, cyber navigator programs that would help them bolster their, um, their defenses as well. I see the reference to Khan Academy. Um, yes, ironically, as we speak, uh, Khan is on a panel right now with the AI Advisory Committee. It's a public meeting, um, but it's happening right now. <laughs> it will be, if you go to ai.gov, um, it will be, it's on public record. Um, so it's on education and other issues around that space. So I think in the next couple of days, you will be able to find the, that public conversation on ai.gov. Can you describe, Susan, what your the advisory panel that you're on and and how it's composed and what the goal is? Yes, um, there's 26 of us from around the country and we were appointed to advise the president's AI initiative office on a variety of, of um, AI issues. So we have uh, several working groups. One is for example, the future of AI, one is um, generative AI, the one that I co-lead is on awareness, education, and um, uh, inclusion in AI. Um, there's one on workers, uh, the workplace in AI. So 
the what we are doing and, and and stay tuned if you're interested follow ai.gov because now we've been together about a year and a, a little over a year and a half we are now in the next few months going to be releasing findings and reports in each of those respective areas and i think you might find it incredibly interesting what's coming up um the majority of the um the group are you know really high level ai leaders in the in the industry and then there's someone like myself who's not, and then there's someone else who's in human rights. So we, there's a variety of people. Um, someone just put in a question about the incentive to actually regulate. Well, it. that's interesting. I don't know what the incentive is because um, the industry is very powerful. They are very powerful lobby. There's very powerful lobbying dollars. Um, so let's just call it what it is. Like that's just how our country runs. Uh, like it or not. So there, there is no incentive other than everybody is finally realizing just because of generative AI. Let's keep in mind, AI didn't was not born with chat GPT. That is just a one form of AI that was released, but that sure got the attention of Congress. In reality, Congress should have been addressing this over the past five years or so, but no one could wrap their heads around it until chat GPT happened and everybody's using it without understanding that we use it all the time. Um, I'll just say, I think it's interesting to note um, a lot of these tech issues tend to be very polarizing, um, but there, there seems to be at least around some issues, less polarization than I would expect than I, I might've expected. And um, you know, on this specific issue of deception around um, candidates, uh, deep fakes, um, there was sort of more bipartisan interest um, than, you know, than than you might think. and and there have been, uh, you know, is at least at least one, and, and maybe more bipartisan bills addressing um, deep fakes um, in the in the Senate. Uh, so um, I think you know this is something that that elected um, leaders are are worried about because it affects them. Well, right. The, I mean, the bottom line is to wrap it up is that even though people understand there's there's something needs to be done. Unfortunately, I don't think the pace is going to really pick up until something terrible happens. And then they're going to really pick up the pace in, in figuring out, okay, we even though they, they're they saying they're doing that now, but, but nothing's moving, primarily because most people just don't understand it. And that's where AI literacy comes in. So thank you so much for having us. Oh, my goodness. We learned so much. I can't even <laughs> begin to say how you've expanded our brains, right, guys? <laughs> I would say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Spread the word. And again, Tuesday, we're launching our campaign. Um, but otherwise, there's other videos on all these different topics. And we're going to be creating more specifically on like AI and health, AI and the older community, AI and education, many things more. I know I see the note is kind of discouraging. It, I really don't want to be doom and gloom. I, really, I mean, because again, there are many great things that are happening. But the reality is, is it's the good and the bad and the ugly. As with any technology, right. regulation is like years behind. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it takes a long time for it to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and All right. Take care, everybody. And thank you. Do you want to give a little wrap up, Anne? Sure, sure. So I would like to thank our presenters for sharing your expertise on this really important topic. We also uh, thank all who registered for this presentation. And as stated, we're we'll, going to send you the link to the recording and additional resources, some that were shared in the chat and others that we've been collecting on this. Um, we hope you join us for future programs listed on our events calendar at lwvcdc.org. Thank you. And thanks to Kathy. She just randomly reached out to me, I think on LinkedIn. So good for you. <laughs> I was walking around listening to your con your podcast. Right. 
interview and I said, this woman, I have to talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> And when I saw you with the League of Women Voters, I was like, absolutely. <laughs> Whoa, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. All right, take care, wait, wait, I think we're going to wait for your launch before we send them all this out. But oh, yeah, a few days. is it Tuesday? What, what Tuesday. Day? Tuesday. All right. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. And Michaela, thank you for sharing all your research and all the info that you've gathered over the years. Thanks Look so much. For reading more of your yeah, things. Keep up the good work. Thank you, you later. Too, guys. Bye-bye.